Hello, and welcome to The Canadian Story, where we discuss what Canada is, what Canada could be, and what Canada should be. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Canadian Story. Today, we are very excited to be joined yet again for the second time by Mr. Roman Babber. Roman, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Good to be with you. So um, what have you been up to the last little while? Um, I first came across you when you wrote that open letter to Doug Ford um, all the way back at the beginning of the the, uh, the pandemic. And that was, I just want to say this now because I, I've been meaning to get this out to you for so long. You were the person who tipped me off f- like before anyone else to the idea that there might be something weird going on with the COVID pandemic because I don't remember exactly when that was, but that was all the way back in my mind, like quite, quite early on, like close to the beginning of the pandemic. And it was the first time I saw published numbers and data that directly conflicted the mainstream narrative. So I want to publicly thank you for your work and for what you did for Ontario and Canada, um, because you you certainly woke me up and I know that you woke a whole lot of other people up. So thank you, Roman. But since that day, since that letter, um, what's been new with you? So, so as you have said, in, in, in early January 2021, I published a letter uh, asking Premier Ford for a balanced public health response. And that essentially what I've suggested is that we have to factor in the collateral harm of the lockdown into our public health response, um, citing uh, various data that specifically we understand that most of the pro risk was localized to long-term care homes and Statistics Canada confirms that more than 80% of those that regretfully passed away were in a congregate long-term care setting that we knew that the virus is much more infectious than we initially thought. So the metrics that we're worried about are are significantly smaller and um, the the hospitalization um, utilization was significantly lower than we thought. We were artificially choking capacity uh, because of COVID protocols and uh, isolation and, and so on. And if, if immediately in the aftermath, about an hour and a half later, uh, I was uh, removed from the Ontario Progressive Conservative Caucus. And since then, I continued uh, in, in our fight against overreaching unreasonable public health response um, and, and also took on defending the personal uh, autonomy of Canadians who, who made a different medical choice than, than most Canadians to, uh, for their right to, to make a personal health care choice. And uh, as probably yourself and uh, most of your viewers know, I've joined the race to become leader of the Federal Conservative Party of Canada, and it's been going pretty well. So I have a whole bunch of questions about that, but the first one is walk, uh, you know, our listeners like the, the meat of the story to hear what's actually going on. So what inspired you in that moment to be like, I'm going to run for leader of the CPC, you know? You've been treated so poorly by the conservative establishment in Ontario, particularly, but you decided to go for it and, and go for the top job, prime minister. Walk us through that decision-making process and why you made that decision. Um, I uh, articulate a respectful indictment of the conservative party every chance I get. I think that the conservative party enough for Canadians in the last couple of years, failed to defend uh, many Canadians against lockdowns, against passports, against mandates, failed to defend their children, against the mental health pandemic that's been perpetrated against them. Um, And really, um, that is consistent with the last two elections, where we failed to articulate clarity uh, Mm -hmm. for what we believe and for what we uh, think is right. And uh, I'm of the view that I... I'm uniquely positioned to project um, clarity and courage that that Canadians are are looking for right now from the Conservative Party of Canada uh, in defense against what by all accounts is a disastrous liberal government. Uh, I am going to restore, I decided that I'm going to restore uh, what I refer to as the principle of principles to the Conservative Party of Canada, where we do what we believe is right and we say what, what we believe. 
I love this idea of saying what we believe. Can you go into why you think that's so important and maybe a bit of your background for listeners who don't know you? Uh, since the last time you were on, we've gained a lot of listeners, uh, as you can imagine, I'm sure. So why don't you share a little bit of why you think that is the principle of all principles? Look, this is at a time when, when Canadians have a, a record deficit of trust in government. And I, I've tried to be consistent and it, it's not unusual to, to disagree with me. And, and, and that's okay, we can disagree, that's democracy, but you will always know where I stand. And I think that that's what the public is looking for. Um, you know, um, I hear more and more that the political class not only failed to stand up for Canadians, but lost all credibility with all Canadians. People think that either politicians are self-dealing or they have some sort of self-interest or they're beholden to a certain agenda. And to some extent it's true, we have a classic agency conflict where politicians are, are putting their political aspirations ahead of the people that they serve. And, and so it's very, very important that we dispel that, that we attract decent, uh, well-meaning professionals and everyday Canadians to, to politics, and that we create trust again with the public. And that can only happen when we speak our truth. Uh, even if it's something that not all folks will disagree, will agree with, at the very least, they'll appreciate that, that you say it, how it is and, and what you believe in. And the voters will reward you for that too, I think. Yeah, but I as, think, um, oh, go ahead, Zach, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I wanted to ask a question kind of off of that. Um, you talk about political gain or um, alternate agenda. Um, my, my question is, what is, as, as someone who spends uh, certainly more time on the Hill than I do, um, what is the climate around um, the COVID crisis on the Hill? Because as a concerned citizen of Canada, I've spent a lot of time um, since, since reading your initial letter and realizing that, wow, the numbers really don't line up with the narrative, I've spent a lot of time, I've dedicated really a lot of the past two years to looking at as best as I can as a private citizen, what is actually going on with the crisis. And it seems to me that there is an, a water flow of information that dissuades from the official public narrative that we see coming from the Hill. Do you think it is as simple as being caught up in political agenda? Is it, if it is an alternate motive, what is that motive? Like what I don't understand when there is so much information that dissuades from what is coming out of Trudeau's office, how they can continue to exist in that bubble without any reverence for any other idea. Can you, do you have anything to say about what that might be? Absolutely. So, so to correct you, I was working out of Queens Park, not from the Hill, but I have a pretty good understanding between conservative and, and liberal politicians and politicians from the entire spectrum as to why we were trapped into this bubble. And that is because the narrative, the COVID politically correct narrative has become fortified by cancel culture. And like with most disagreements with, with you have a popular sentiment uh, coming from the left that cannot be uh, straight from at the risk of cancellation or losing your job or losing your column or being ousted by your board of directors, then, then people fall into line and they um, refuse to articulate a dissenting opinion. So in this case, for many, it was the political agenda of survival because going against the mainstream narrative would cost you your seat or, or your job, just like it, it cost me my role with the government caucus and my chairmanship of the Justice Committee. And, and so that's what happened. Uh, it was a combination. And, and if I may take another minute to, to explain generally what I think has transpired. So this, there was this remarkable virus that we haven't seen before. We weren't testing a lot. And, and so because of that, we didn't anticipate how prevalent the virus is. Because of that, we thought that the metrics that we're worried about, like hospitalizations and, and deaths, the rates are very, very high. 
But then two months into it, we learned a number of things. So, so, so sorry. So this narrative developed that we have to protect one another and keep everyone safe uh, or else, you know, you're not in line with, with saving lives. And that predominant narrative became um, very strong. But then, of course, we learned that the virus is a lot more transmissible. So the metrics we're worried about are significantly lower. We were worried that most of the risk was in long-term care homes. But instead of adjusting our risk perception of the virus, we continued to respond to it as if it's still March or April 2020. And any suggestion to the contrary would, would land you on the opposite side of cancel culture. Of course, there are a lot of reasons why uh, it continued to go on for, for personal agendas. Persons like Doug Ford or Jason Kenney have enjoyed remarkable popularity after the first wave. They were viewed as heroes. So they wanted to continue along with, uh, you know, the perception that they're saving lives because it was good for their politics. Uh, persons like Justin Trudeau, the radical left interventionists, for them, this was a, an opportunity to further insert the state into um, in, in, to insert the state into our lives and into our businesses. Uh, for tech, tech has accelerated by 10 years. Uh, petty corruption, uh, whether it's the manufacturers or, or uh, people with all sorts of interests, there is no shortage of reasons why this all culminated into this remarkable exercise. But on the political side, it's mostly fear, fear of the left and cancel culture, fear that we don't have to have. I think Canadians will appreciate us standing up for them. I apologize, I was lying. No, no, I, I completely agree. I want you to go uh, in more of what you just said, fear of the left. What does that look like? Why should we be afraid? A lot of people are afraid. I couldn't agree more. I'm not afraid of being canceled anymore. And part of that is because of people like you who, who've shown that if we stand on our principles, we can get results. I mean, I think it's actually quite miraculous that you were allowed to run for the Conservative Party of Canada leadership con considering your, your views. But I think that speaks to what the truckers were able to accomplish, what you were able to accomplish by walking a very fine line between saying we have to obey the laws, but they're not good laws. Uh, but I want you to speak a little bit more towards that fear and the psychology around it and how you've seen it used perhaps uh, where you grew up as well and, and why you were so attuned to this where other people weren't necessarily. David, over the last uh, decade to two decades, we've seen uh, a radical decline in our ability to express ourselves on everyday issues. Um, for, for instance, I think towards uh, you know, the 2015 election, uh, it became clear that the public no longer felt that fiscal responsibility is an appropriate thing to articulate on because, you know, then you're evil spirited because you want cuts, nor was there any discussion allowed with respect to the environment. Um, if, if you were against the carbon tax, then you are some sort of a science denier. Um, who um, is heartless and, and cares for and doesn't care for the planet, and and you would be immediately canceled. Mm -hmm. Whereas all of those issues are not just legitimate; they're, they're necessary to discuss. I do not believe the taxing Sally ten bucks at the gas pump is one going to change her behavior, is going to make life for her. But I also I, I don't think that it will have any material effect on the climate. And, and to suggest something like that is, is not something that we're able to because of the daily cancel culture that, that streams from the left. And look, as, as you've pointed, uh, this is something that I've experienced before. Uh, my family, as, as you know, some of your viewers know, I was born in the former Soviet Union. We didn't leave until I was nine. And you also had this prohibition on, on articulating dissent against state narrative. Uh, whether it's by fear of being deemed crazy, a best case scenario, or incarceration for political dissent, dissent worst case scenario. But a lot of, a lot of this is, is common thread, uh, and that is canceling people or threatening people into silence. And, and that's not just bad for our democracy, it's also bad for public policy. Speaking of fear of the left, do you think within the current administration that those on the left also fear the left. So you talk about cancel culture in, in not just the sense of um, general society or your popularity or 
um, what mean people might say to you on the internet. You talk about like actual government position. And obviously, in a sense, you were canceled um, when you were removed from the caucus. But do you think that there are people within the current liberal administration who do see some of the some of the things coming out of the woodwork, but continue to toe the line just simply for the purpose of holding their positions? So look, absolutely. Uh, we, we often see the left cancel the left for not being left enough. That at least explains the most recent election in Ontario, where Doug, uh, sorry, where, uh, of course, Doug Ford won again, in my view, because there was no alternative, uh, where Stephen Del Duca and Andrea Horvath try to outcompete each other for the left. But we've seen a, a very good, clear example of the left eating itself uh, in the same manner, and that's the Green Party of Canada. Uh, Anna Meepal, uh, who I who I think is a, a, a fantastic individual, uh, a, a smart lawyer. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I think brought some much needed rejuvenation into the Green Party. Um, and she was effectively canceled and ousted by her own party because of her views on Israel in the Middle East. And of course, she was accused of, of bias towards the state of Israel. Uh, she is she is Jewish herself. And and the Green Party that has traditionally under Elizabeth May, uh, in my view, articulated positions that are very anti-Israel, um, have effectively ran her out of town. So so this is not this is not just left versus right. This, this definitely happens on the left. But, you know, Zach, I, I think that all of these propositions now, because of covid. I think that the traditional. Uh, traditional uh, uh, names and, and frameworks like liberals, like Greens, like New Democrats are being tested. I think- no, Very, very true, very true. I see a lot of, every day people approach me at my rallies or at my events saying, Roman, I, 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 I would never imagine voting conservatives. I certainly would never take out a conservative membership, but I took one out for you. And it's amazing. So I speak to a lot of what I call classical liberals. Those are the Paul Martin types. And they can, they love individual freedoms, they love free enterprise, and they can't believe what's happening in our country. I speak the New Democrats probably most, blue collar New Democrats, hardworking Canadians who say that they feel that the New Democrats betrayed them. And, and sure they have. They refuse to stand up for their jobs. And, and I hold Jagmeet Singh equally responsible for everything that's happening in our country right now. And the Greens, I call them freedom-loving Greens. I have a, a, a Green friend who's uh, working on my campaign and a volunteer on my campaign. And she says, Roman, before this, I did not take Advil. And now I'm told that I need to take two shots to, to lead a normal life. Uh, that's unacceptable to me. So I think we have a remarkable opportunity now to to reach to people who traditionally were on the other side of the political aisle uh, and and invite them into into the conservative tent. I think you're entirely correct. Um, even just like in my own personal experience, one of my best friends uh, voted NDP his entire life, and then COVID hit. And he started voting blue. And just last week, another friend of mine, I was having a conversation with him over lunch. He, the words out of his mouth were literally, the pandemic turned me conservative. Yeah. <laughs> you see that, you see that more and more. And it's, I think you're entirely correct. I think, I think um, the legacy Jagmeet Singh will leave behind for the NDP is that he, in the face of an, it, it, when he when he was presented with an opportunity to protect blue collar workers, he instead sold out, and and um, I think the legacy he will leave for that party will will just simply be one of of ruining it in in many ways because that party is supposed to represent the the common individual the the working class and when the truckers came to Ottawa he he flopped right in with the liberals and he left all of those people for dead and i see that i see you mentioned the the challenging of like kind of party ideals what's most interesting to me about the climate of the left these days is that they are supposed to be the 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 party of tolerance and acceptance and they have become the party of cancellation, as far as I can tell. Um, what do you think drove the left from being a party of tolerance to being a party of do and say the right thing or you're out? Power. 
I, I think about this often and the answer is power. So traditionally, critical theorists, you know, this is a, uh, I don't know, it's Friday afternoon, so we're just, we're having fun. Yes, um, yes. I think it's Let's Friday, right? We need something new for the listeners. They hear the same stuff. Your message, I mean, it's great, but we, we need something like uh, some theory. Yeah, Let's get some theory. Sure. Yeah. L- listen, so traditionally, critical theorists, they used to challenge the establishment. They used to say, the, uh, you know, the corporations own the media, and obviously the media plays with the right, and we need to safeguard individual freedoms, and, and we need to be able to articulate. And so traditionally, it was the left that would champion individual freedoms, starting with speech. Uh, at least that's was, that was the conception. I, I don't necessarily subscribe to that. But in the last couple of decades, as the left started gaining power, as it seeped itself, as, to, as, as this ideology seeped itself into academia, into the boardroom, into obviously government, uh, now uh, they, it's, it's, you know, power, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So goes the saying. Now they want to maintain that power. Now they want to fortify the institutions that they control by, by undermining the very principles that they traditionally thought for. Um, and, and that includes choice, right? I mean, choice is, is such a fundamentally, uh, and a health choice is a fundamentally traditional left-wing proposition. And now you hear Jagmeet Singh going on the Evan Solomon show, threatening Canadians, threatening Canadians with consequences if they don't engage in the medical procedure that he wants them to. It's unheard of. Uh, so that's, that's what I think it is. And I like that, the power. I want to go into that further. As, since you spent time in the Soviet Union where power was the fundamental principle, it's a, it's a fundamental principle of Marxist thought is that power is the building block of all things and that we need to take power away from the elite and give it to the people and eventually we'll have a utopian society. You saw that play out in real time and how it didn't work. Why, don't you, why do you think power is their fundamental value? Because people would choose democracy. People would choose to decentralize if given the choice. I think it's a Margaret Thatcher quote. Uh, given the choice, uh, people would choose freedom. And, and, and that freedom is, is not in line with the politics of the day, right? Justin Trudeau has now staked his reputation so far on, on mandates that he can't retreat from it. I mean, we're learning that Theresa Tam, I'm no fan of Theresa Tam, you know that. I'm going to fire her on day one. But, yeah, yeah. but, but she was telling him for months that the science does, no longer requires uh, travel passports. And what do, we, what do we find out? That in spite of that, Justin Trudeau wanted to continue to perpetuate the passports. Why? Because he has staked his political career on this, on, on this division, disgusting division that he has perpetuated between Canadians. For him to come around right now and say, oh, I was just kidding, no more, especially as they're threatening the seventh <laughs> wave in the fall. He can't do that. He can't do that politically, which is why I'm saying, like, the enemy of all of this is, is probably politics. And, and left-wing politics requires that they stick around to this, to this conformity that they have demanded now. They can't retreat. And actually, that puts them in a really weak position, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely, because he's exposed, right? And I've always looked at this as the, 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 the fairy tale about uh, the, the king, the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> yep. At some point, yep. you call it out and you say, look, uh, you, you've been telling me that you're saving lives. Well, nonsense. Uh, we, we, with, 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 by way of uh, preventing transmission, we know that it's just as transmissible from someone who's, in, who's vaccinated or unvaccinated. The argument they used to make traditionally uh, was um, if you are unvaccinated, then you're more likely to get infected. And if you're infected, then you're more likely to transmit statistically. That's out the window now because the manufacturer says, and every chief officer, medical officer says, two shots have minimum protection against infection. So it's out, it's it's off the table. And yet they're unwilling to retreat because then Canadians will say, 
well, why have you put us through this? Why have you strained the relationship between me and my family? Why have you caused us to mistreat our employees? Why have you made us behave in, in, in an unprecedented, un-Canadian way? They can have that happen. This will be the end of the Liberal Party. I think it will be the end of it anyways. They can't hide it. The emperor has no clothes. Uh, uh, then that's so much hope. It's so good to have that kind of hope that you're giving people because I, I couldn't agree more. I Actually, do you remember the book, The Big Shift, that came out uh, near the end of Harper's time where he talked about, uh, they said that this was long-term, the death of the Liberal Party. And then it looked like that was totally untrue with uh, Justin Trudeau coming in and being so popular, but he's lost a lot of popularity. And I want to talk about something that's been very interesting on your campaign is seeing people who've traditionally not been involved in politics coming into the political uh, sphere, getting involved, helping you. A lot of your biggest supporters have never done anything in politics before. You're an organizer, you're a person who cares about politics. You mobilize people for causes. You've been doing a great job on that with your with everything you've been doing, standing up for the freedom movement. But I want to talk a little bit about what it's like just on a technical level and as a leader to be leading all of these people who've never experienced anything in politics before. So I, I like to joke with, with people that uh, life is better without politics. Don't download, <laughs> don't get Twitter. Life is better that way. And, and traditionally, lack of engagement in politics, apathy, would be a good sign. It, it, it's in the countries where things are not good, where people are more engaged in politics traditionally and, and fight about politics and, and make politics personal, right? And, and I, I think about that traditionally when, when my friends uh, overseas would, would uh, or, or folks from other parts of the world would ask me, how is it, you know, what's the news like in Canada? And for many years, you know, you turn on the morning news, and, and they tell you about Mrs. Jones's cat got on the tree. So they had to call the fire department and they got the, tr the cat down and, and, and there's a snowstorm and <laughs> wow, what a wonderful life. Right. <laughs> yes, so, yes. And, and so, but that's not the case anymore because now politics profoundly affects so profoundly and materially affects so many people's lives to the negative that, ev and everybody also understands what remarkable impact government and politics and the people that run those institutions have in their immediate life that they can't help but being engaged. And, and so part of me almost wishes that that didn't happen because it happened at a great cost. And, and, and the other thing I'm, I'm feeling, and you know, David, we, we can't be talking about this in the abstract because these folks that we're engaging generally uh, either themselves personally or are concerned and suffering for other people. You know, many, many of the people that work immediately on my campaign have not made many sacrifices during the pandemic, but they see the suffering of other people and they say, look, we were blessed in our lives and we now need to stand up for, for fellow Canadians because the level of suffering out there in terms of people, people's at loss to uh, access to healthcare, people's mental health, obviously people's finances, things are really, really bad out there. So that's that's what I think brings about this political engagement. And I feel that we need to give them a voice. And, and this campaign that I'm running, this is our opportunity to give all of those Canadians a voice to, to set the record straight, to get us out of this mess and to play a major role in, in the next uh, government, if not to lead it. So I couldn't agree more. And it's, and it's very, I'm glad you brought it up. The, the pain and suffering that so many have experienced throughout all of this has been really catastrophic. And I, I don't, I think it's very underestimated by, by a lot, many, many people. I don't think they realize kind of the trauma I say that has been experienced by so many of our fellow Canadians. I mean, even for myself, I wasn't able to go to my own grandmother's funeral. Right, that's a, an example of, of what happens. I, I'm very grateful uh, for the hard work that you and, and many others have done in making it so we can fly again soon. But let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, there's a lot, obviously a lot of hope. I'm going to be flying to Toronto. Hopefully, I'll see you and many others there. But it's just going to be good to be back on planes. But that's our, our fight is not even close to ended, and we're already getting these signals. 
that uh, they're going to try to bring back restrictions in the fall. We had here in Alberta open for summer, open forever already. We've, we've been through this movie. What do you think uh, the next six months hold? And how do you see us navigating those perhaps looking like choppy economic waters combined with an attempt of the medical establishment to reassert the control? I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic on, on the pandemic side, pandemic response side. I don't think that Justin Trudeau or any of the premiers have the political capital to lock us down again. I think that we see that the appetite for the booster is simply not there. It's, it's at about 50, 55%. And whereas they try to squeeze the minority um, when it was 20, when it was 10 to 20%, uh, that that type of a minority is easier to squeeze than half the population. So I don't think I'm optimistic that by way of a public health response, we're probably out of the woods. What I am uh, suggesting, however, is that everything that precipitated this public health response, um, all the tactics that were used on Canadians for the first time, the censorship, the um, uh, demonizing uh, opposition, all of those, I'm afraid, remain. And and by that, I refer to what I talk about, the erosion of our democracy, is that the erosion of democracy, the surveillance state, the uh, digital tracking state, the uh, state-sponsored media that demonizes opponents and and shuts out views. Those I'm worried are here to stay, which is why it's so important we fight and, and, and roll back against this erosion of our democracy. So we've got uh, a leadership race happening here in Alberta as well. Uh, I'm not going to ask you if you would support, but there's been two policies that have kind of been pushed forward that I would like your thoughts on from a federal level. The first is that Rajan Sani from Northeast Calgary, a great uh, MLA and minister, has said that she will, she's calling for a public inquiry into a private, independent public inquiry into how the pandemic was handled in Alberta. And then the second is now that Daniel Smith is calling for act number one will be a sovereignty act to block any federal legislation in Alberta that's seen as detrimental to the best interests of Albertans. So uh, I'd like your thoughts on both of those uh, from your perspective on the federal scene, because obviously our country is in uh, quite a bit of disarray, perhaps on the edge of falling apart. Uh, and you, as someone who's running to be a federal politician, uh, that's going to be something you're going to have to address. So the second part of sovereignty is important, but also what are your thoughts on an independent public inquiry? Yeah, so... Dave, almost every room I go to people want accountability, and I want it too. I really want accountability. But I say that you're not going to get accountability until we get a favorable government that is interested in the facts and is interested to subjecting uh, those that led the pandemic response accountable, at least on the federal level. So you, we're not going to have access to emails, to witnesses, to uh, processes, uh, and you see this right now with the truckers, uh, with, the, with the Emergencies Act inquiry, where instead of uh, questioning the propriety of the invocation of the Emergencies Act, Justin Trudeau is continuing to prosecute Canadians. So in order for us to, to get that accountability and to get that transparency, we need to kick out the Liberals. That's number one. Number two, I personally favor judicial inquiry. I want an independent judicial inquiry because that will... Uh, give more credibility to the result, but also it will allow the inquiry greater access in that uh, such justice, a reputable justice should have subpoena powers uh, with the ability to summon witnesses and documents um, and, and ensure cooperation with such process and, and making uh, the uh, ex existence of, of documents essential to law. Um, so you can see I've given some thought to this. Um, I'm, I, I'd like a, a judicial inquiry and, and under my government, um, there will be a judicial inquiry that will leave no stone unturned. And, and that would also mean not just understanding why and how, 
whether there were any personal gain, whether we can account for every cent, how certain decisions were arrived at, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and then on the sovereignty, uh, Alberta Sovereignty Act, uh, how do you feel about provinces further asserting their sovereignty? So, look, um, I've always been in favor of, I, I've always respected Canada's division of powers. And uh, there's no question that we have way too much power centralized in Ottawa. The only time I think that uh, Ottawa needs to be overbearing in terms of uh, its influence would be to protect Canadians against human right abuses or, or breaches to their democracy. For instance, something like we're seeing in Quebec right now with Bill 96 or, or Bill 21, I will defend all Quebecers. But I, I think that I'm going to do everything I can, and you and I have had these conversations, to try and, and heal our, our regional divides. And, and I'm, I'm going to come to the West uh, and I've been, as you know, I've been hanging out west for quite yeah, a bit lately. Yeah. I and I love it there too. Uh, <laughs> but, well, we're looking but, forward to having you for the stampede for sure. <laughs> I, I will. I, I I can't wait. You're you're looking forward to seeing me in a cowboy outfit or what? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so so look, I, I've said it multiple times. First of all, the best way to bring unity to our country is through economic opportunity, and I will do that by unleashing. Our, our, our natural resources. I'd like to make Canada the natural resources superpower that it ought to be. And of course, uh, the West will, will be central to that plan. Second of all, uh, I will insist on uh, the fact that we have to phase out equalization. I'm running against Canadian socialism and I don't like this dependency on province by another province. Um, I, I'm, I'm not worried about the constitutional aspect of it. Um, I will see whether provinces are able to deliver the same level of services. And if they cannot, we're going to give them three to four years to catch up before I phase out equalization by the end of my first term. That should give the West some comfort. And finally, I, I mean it seriously. We have to bring all Canadians into the national conversation. And, and that means um, having having meaningful discussions, something that the West has been shut out of. So while I appreciate this appetite at, at more, at, at, at more self-governance, uh, I am in favor of, of clearly respecting your interests and, and the division of powers. But I ask, please, that you bear with me as, as we try to rectify this. I have a, I have a question. Oh, Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you said something very interesting to me, bringing all Canadians into the conversation. Um, so my question is, obviously, there has been a group of Canadians um, over the course of this administration who have been more and more um, censored and pushed out of the conversation. And obviously, you represent someone who wants to give those Canadians voices. But in the interest of, of excluding censorship... How do you plan on dealing with your dissenters and how, um, I guess, contrast yourself from someone like Justin Trudeau, who refused to even meet the truckers? How do you plan, should you be elected, to handle the people who disagree with you and also give them a voice? Without democracy, we don't have anything, Zach. And there is no democracy without freedom of speech. And we know what the line is. The line is clearly articulated in the criminal code. Do not incite violence. Do not demonize an identifiable group of people, something, in fact, that I think the prime minister does. But, but short of that, I don't understand why we need to censor Canadians and, or, or not allow them to be heard. Um, as I've said, I think free speech is not just good for democracy. It's good for public policy. Because by appreciating where the baseline is with respect to certain issues, you're, you're better equipped to make decisions. And I, I don't suffer from, um, I, I have confidence to allow for my critics to disagree with me. I, you bet I've, I have experienced a lot of disagreement over the last couple of years. You can't imagine, <laughs> you yes. can't imagine the stuff I, I read that's written to me. Um, but at the, at the same time, and, and that would apply in, in my parliamentary democracy as well. 
and, and this is a question that's come up a number of times in the last couple of weeks. If a member of parliament has a fundamental disagreement with me, especially as to f- something fundamental like saving lives, which is what, what my disagreement with Doug Ford was over, then, then who am I to, to penalize them or, or censor them? And, and that's another thing. I don't think that members of parliament work for the boss or, or for the party or for the government. They work for their own constituents. And if, if maybe political leadership respected that a little more, um, we, we'd have better outcomes and, and we certainly have more, more peace within, within the conservative family. That's the key to uniting our country and uniting the Conservative Party, too, is to allow and entertain respectful difference of opinion, not centralize it in the boss. Oh, oh, that's a really good point. One of the things you said to me a lot is that you love how much democracy Alberta has. And I've been thinking a lot about democracy and you and I've had a lot of conversations about democracy. And obviously, we've had a huge democratic effort in Alberta recently that ended up in the resignation of our premier. But I don't want to talk about that. What I want to talk about is your love for democracy as a system, not not as a philosophy, but you've been engaged in it for most of your uh, adult life. I think all of your adult life. You were uh, were a young uh, conservative in university even. Talk about a little bit of of your love of the the process of democracy and and maybe give us an anecdote of, of something that happened to you before all of this COVID stuff that just made you love democracy? Democracy just brings about good results. It's, it's just natural that way, right? When humans are free to do things without infringing on the rule of law or harming one another, they can arrive at great results. One of the, one of the earliest memories I have when, when we left the Soviet Union, um, we, we first came to Israel before I came to Canada. And I remember tasting Coca-Cola for, for the first time when I was nine. And, and I loved it since day one. It's, it's just so sweet and, and the texture is great and it's cold and bubbly. And um, I, I sort of associate that with democracy. And I wasn't surprised to learn that Coca-Cola has the same message. It, it, it seeks to further democracy around the world. Uh, with with this drink, um, you know, that's why I also believe, like in Alberta, that free enterprise, the ability to go out and and wanting to make a living and and become an employer, and and I was an employer before I got into politics, um, to not not to rely on government, but instead pay tax for the betterment of your community. Uh, those are wonderful things, and. People, I, I think Canadians especially, are very hardworking. And instead of finding ways for them not to work, like mandates or lockdowns or regulatory stuff or, or an inability to develop our natural resources or universal basic income, the most recent iteration of not letting Canadians work, <laughs> yeah, or, or yeah. creating, more, creating more state dependency, we need to do the opposite of that. You know, um, I, I, I like to tell a story when how I how I became conservative. Um, it, I, was, I think I was six or seven, and I was walking with Dad through uh, some some gardens outside of Saint Petersburg, and and there was uh, a sign on the lawn saying "Do not feed the squirrels." And I asked, "Well, why can't you feed the squirrels?" And he said, "Because if you feed the squirrels, then they're going to stop collecting nuts." They're going to create dependency on humans and they're not going to assemble enough nuts for the winter and they're going to starve. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th- that's it right there. That's, uh, that's and so the I decided it, it, instead of, instead of human beings, of course. And, and I love, uh, the, the fact that, that Canada, those that cannot, because they're either unable to, or, or they're not feeling well, legitimately, of course, we should help those that cannot do and, and work, but those that can work should be encouraged to work. And, and we should encourage human ingenuity and prosperity and free enterprise. It's not government that pays the bill. It's employers and, and small and medium and large business that pays the bills. Absolutely. It's the, it's the taxpayers that pay the bills, right? It's You're us. Right. Um, exactly. I, w- I want to just you to give a little bit to the listeners of like 
who is Roman as a person? What do you love? Like, what do you do when you're not, uh, when you're not campaigning? Obviously you're campaigning all the time right now, but like in your ideal life, when politics is behind you, how are you going to spend your time? I'm going to play some tennis. I like tennis a lot. And, um, I, I, I think many of your viewers know I'm a huge basketball fan and I'm a huge fan of the Toronto Raptors. Uh, eight weeks after I came to Canada, this was in 1995. My best buddy in high school at the time said, you know, the, the, the Toronto got a new NBA team. They're starting tonight. We can get a ticket for like a toonie. And <laughs> I was, I was at the very first Toronto Raptors basketball game. Wow. A- Did they win? I forget, but it was a preseason game against the New York Knicks. And I, I remember I was 15 years old. I just came to Canada like eight weeks ago and I saw Patrick, Patrick Ewing, uh, jumping for the tip off. And I was, we were hooked. <laughs> I was hooked day one. And, um, you know, I, I think that's something that I hope resonates with people. I'm an ordinary dude. Um, I, I'm not, I'm far from perfect. Um, and, and I just, you know, David, maybe that's why that's why I've been so passionate in the last couple of years in defense of Canadians, because I know how precious life is. I know what it's like to to want to try and enjoy life and and enjoy other people and and enjoy entertainment and 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 to watch all of those things being eroded, being taken away from us. Uh, it was not was not something that I was willing to watch. That actually stems from just really loving life. Um, yeah, right. Love, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> it really is. Uh, you said something to me once that I think the listeners would maybe uh, appreciate. But uh, I've had a lot of uh, men of faith, rabbis, and uh, Muslims, and First Nation spiritual guides on this podcast. I know you're a man of faith as well. And you, you said to me that you've been blessed in life. And, and part of your belief is that when you are blessed, that means you need to be a blessing. You want to share a little bit about that? Uh, uh, absolutely. Look, uh, of course, our, our faith to, to some of us is a little more private than others. Um, I am, um, uh, I am I'm Jewish. And um, it's, it's, it's very, very important in my faith to appreciate your blessings. And um, I, to, to, I would hope that we all have some sort of those of us that choose faithful uh, to have a, a contract with the Lord. And it, it can be uh, inverted in terms of um, timeline. In other words, it's not as if, you know, we, we do something good and we hope for good karma. Uh, I came to this country at age 15. We didn't have a cent to our name. I had every opportunity to to go to school, to to work hard, to succeed, to build a small business, to be elected from the community that that welcomed me as a Ukrainian. Uh, I've been blessed with wonderful uh, friends, uh, with with a terrific uh, person that that loves me very much, and um, and from that stems my duty. To, and, and to anyone, in fact, whether they're in any position of leadership, of politics and outside of politics, to stand up for other Canadians against the injustice that we're seeing right now. And in defense that this wonderful light that we would want to lead after politics, um, we, I, I honestly think, David, this is the best country in the world. And we can fix, we can fix what ails us very, very quickly. We can give ourselves a lot of relief right away, uh, namely with two items. One is democracy. Get government, just end this public health exercise. Let us deal with, with the pandemic with, with the way that we would choose to do or in consultation with our doctor. De- uh, uh, extricate government out of our daily lives and the censorship. Let us function normally. So that's the first one, democracy. And the second one is natural resources. I think they're a blessing. They're great for our strategic interests, for economic interests. I think they're great for the planet because Canadians can derive and, and produce energy cleaner than any other nation on earth. And we would immediately would help this inflation situation. We would help the cost of living. Uh, would, would crawl out of the economic hole that we're in. Um, let people work and, and develop our natural resources. We know what the formula is. We can get there. Um, I hope to get there. 
Well, thank you very much for your time, Roman. We really appreciate you taking a little bit of time off the campaign trail to come back and give our listeners an update on where you are. Obviously, I'm uh, backing you and helping you in this. I, I believe you stood up for us and that it's our job now as citizens of this country to stand up for you. So I'm proud of you for what you're doing. I want to thank you for uh, standing up through the dark times. Sometimes I know you felt quite alone. A lot of us did. And the truckers obviously brought a lot of us together. And now many of them are supporting you. So thank you very much. Uh, do you have a last uh, request that you'd like to make of the listeners? Uh, maybe they can't buy memberships anymore, but I know that we can always use donations at the Roman Baber campaign or Baber campaign. I always pronounce your name wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, the Roman okay. Baber campaign can always use donations, but is there any other ways that people can uh, help or get in touch with you or, or get your message out? Absolutely. They can get in touch with us at journalman.ca and we certainly welcome donations. I think people know that we're probably one of the least funded campaigns, even though we're punching well above our weight. Our average donation size is smaller than any other candidate and still we're trucking along. Uh, so it's at journalman.ca because we're coast to coast, truly grassroots. And, and the other thing is um, to, to those Canadians that are considered to those conservative members that are, are thinking about voting for another candidate, appreciate that this is a ringed ballot, that uh, you, you have an opportunity to, to vote for a candidate, for more than one candidate of your choice. And we ask that you consider to rank me first on your leadership ballot uh, and, and rank uh, another candidate, perhaps a more popular candidate second, um, because they, they're still likely to get your vote uh, if I get eliminated off the ballot before them and, and keep an open mind. And, and, and finally, I'd say, David, I, I have some optimism. I'm, I'm feeling a sense of optimism, not just about my campaign, but about what's happening in our country. I think the Justin Trudeau government is in trouble. I think the media is turning on them. You have four or five ministers that are in major trouble. And uh, I think they're on the ropes. Same with I Jagmeet. agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Same with Jagmeet Singh. So let's keep on hammering at them. Hopefully the future is bright. I, I think we make it bright. And it's because of people like you standing up. So thank you. Thanks a lot, brother. Thank you for listening to The Canadian Story. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at The CAD Story. That's The CAD Story. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with your friends and family. Let's work together to remind Canadians how great our country is.